Welcome to our channel, Behind My Story. Please like, share, and subscribe. Our feelings are always hard to control. We are humans, after all. Sometimes we do things we can't explain, just because we feel that way. I had a student named Daniel, a sweet and innocent child. I was prepared to do anything for him, but don't judge me just yet. First, let me tell you my story. My name is Jolene. I'm a 21-year-old math teacher at a primary school. I live with my sister and my mother. My house was next to the school where I work. I love teaching, and I like teaching the students in creative ways. They loved me, and I loved them. Daniel was a special student, though. Our story began at the start of the new year. It was the first day of school. I missed all my students over the summer break. I missed them so much that I stood by the door to welcome them back. Before I started my first lesson, Mr. Smith, the student affairs officer, knocked on the class door, with Daniel hiding behind his back. Mr. Smith greeted the class and asked them to greet Daniel, but Daniel was too shy and didn't move. So I went over to him to take him by the hand, but he pulled his hand away, which embarrassed Mr. Smith. I asked him to greet his classmates, so he went and he stood in front of the class and he said, Hello, I am Daniel. Then he went and he sat at the very back of the class. He didn't talk much with the other kids. He didn't like to interact with anyone. Daniel always looked sad, and I thought to myself, he's only eight. What could possibly have made him that way? I tried to get close to him, but he resisted all my efforts. Sometimes he looked like he was hiding some big secret. And later on, I learned what it was. One night, when I was surfing the social media, I came across a horrible news story about a jealous husband killing his wife and another man right in front of his son. The child had been none other than my new student, Daniel. Reading that sad story, I started understanding why Daniel was acting that way. I decided to try brightening his life a little. Every day, I would buy a small present and put it on his desk. At first, it had no effect, but slowly he came to love that. During break time, I would sit beside him and we would share food together. I would get him involved in class activities. On his birthday, I arranged a surprise party with his class, his grandmother, and myself. He was so happy that day. After the party, he hugged me and he told me that he loved me. I hugged him tightly. He was not just a student to me. I treated him like he was my own son. He told me that he wanted to call me mother, and that made me so happy. After his grandmother died, he came to live with me. We faced a lot of problems together, but I followed his success in life with pride. Daniel is all grown up now. He's graduating from the Faculty of Engineering. I am so proud of what he has made of himself. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm 23 years old, and I teach art. I recently got married to the love of my life, Norman. I considered him my friend, my brother, my son, and my husband. We love to prank each other, even after we got married. For instance, one time, I turned off all the lights in the apartment, dressed up as a monster, and scared the living daylights out of him when he came back from the store. Another time, he damaged my car. I put mayonnaise on his toast. I did worry sometimes that our jokes might go too far. I mean, he did get really mad at me once. He stopped talking to me for two days, even though I apologized profusely many times. After that, our pranks sort of stopped. I figured our pranking days were over. About a month later, I returned home to find a letter on the floor. I opened it and read it. If you don't pay us a hundred thousand by Friday, we will kill Norman. I smiled. Norman was pranking me again. When he returned home, I hugged him and showed him his prank letter. He read it carefully and his bro furrowed. He appeared seriously frightened and swore that this was not part of any prank. He told me that we needed to leave town as soon as possible. I asked him why. And he told me that before he married me, he had stolen a gold statue from a motorcycle gang. I asked him why he couldn't just return it with an apology. And he told me that the statue was worth a lot of money and could make us really wealthy. That night, an armed masked burglar broke into our apartment and confronted us with a gun. He said to Norman, Hello, Norman. Long time no see. You need to choose between the statue or your wife. Choose now. Norman was hesitant. Then, he steadfastly said, I can't give up the statue. Take my wife. The masked man turned towards me. 
He pointed the gun at me in a threatening manner. I was frantic. I was staring at Norman in shock. Suddenly, the masked man ripped off his mask. It was Keanu, Norman's brother. Norman sat down, laughing so hard he could hardly stop to breathe. Between laughs, he said, This is payback for the last prank of yours. I was so mad at him that day, but it's all right. He doesn't know what I have planned for him. I am Brenda's child. Or at least I was. Because my grandmother had died and my mother at some point in her life felt that drugs would be beneficial to her, I was put into foster care at the age of two and adopted at the age of seven. I have no real memory of Brenda, just her name and the last time I saw her. I was seven and I had gone to a foster care agency for a visit. She brought me some strawberry candy. I remember my adoptive mother telling me to say thank you, and I did. Then Brenda got up and told me she would see me again. I went back to the agency a month later for a visit, and she never showed up. My mother was gone, and I was no longer her child. I was fully aware of being adopted because my adoptive parents, who I've lived with for the past four years, asked me how I would feel being their child, and I said I had no problem with it. So they adopted me and my biological sister at the same time. I can remember that when I got adopted, I was happy, but at the same time sad. I was happy because I had a family, a nice warm bed to sleep in every night, plenty of food to eat, and a place to run around. I was sad because I never got to say goodbye to Brenda, and the last time I saw her, I didn't take in what she looked like. I was sad because she never showed up to me again. She had lied when she said that she would. I'm not sure why I never saw Brenda again, but for years I looked at myself as an intrusion. I figured she didn't want to see me anymore because I needed things and that would get in the way of her buying her drugs. When I went to sleep, I'd have dreams that Brenda had been looking for me and found me. I'd have dreams that she would recognize me and come up to me and say, It's me, your mother. But I never talked about these things. I guess. I just didn't see the point. It wouldn't have changed the feeling of loneliness that she had left behind. Besides, I didn't even know what exactly I was feeling. So keeping my feelings inside seemed normal, but it also left me even lonelier. My adoptive parents didn't make it that easy for me to talk either. It wasn't that they weren't good to me. They took me on road trips, they took me to, and great adventures, and they got my hair done every two weeks. They gave me a stable home, something I probably would have never had if I had been in foster care or still lived with Brenda. But my adoptive mother jumped to conclusions when I would try to tell her little things about boys or school or anything that happened in my life. She always assumed I was getting in some kind of trouble. So there wasn't any way I would have told her about my most painful private thoughts, even if I had thought of telling her. Instead, I just tried to be a nice kid who always seemed happy. I would smile, laugh, and joke. I'd come home and talk about everybody under the sun and how they were doing, except myself. I didn't want my adoptive parents to feel as if I wasn't appreciative or that I didn't love them, so I tried to act as if everything was good. When you're adopted, you feel like your adoptive parents at one point or another are going to expect you to be grateful. You imagine they're thinking, we could have left you in foster care. A and I was grateful, but there was still a part of me that was angry at having to be grateful for just being their child. There was a part of me that didn't trust their love. A part that said, what makes you love me when my real mother didn't love me? What's so real about your love? When I was angry, I expressed my pain by either writing or acting out, or sometimes both. At school, I had a quick temper. I got into physical fights and cursed people out. I ran away from home a lot, more times than I can count. My family couldn't understand why I acted the way I did, and neither could I. I just knew that I felt bad. It wasn't until I got into my teens that I said to myself that it was Brenda's loss to not know me, and I wasn't going to worry about her anymore. If she couldn't take care of me, then she couldn't have had me. So what if I was an intrusion? She made me an intrusion. If I was out in the street and the thought of her would enter my mind, I would turn my head and find something to distract me. If I was at home, 
I would get up and grab a book or watch television. But even while I blocked her out, the hurt continued, and my behavior got worse and worse. I spoke whatever was on my mind and cared very little about how people were feeling. My most common response to anything anybody said to me was, whatever. I was rude, rebellious, and the smallest things ticked me off. I had a non-caring attitude, and the worse I got, the more frustrated and angry my parents got. By the time I was 12 or 13, my mother and I weren't really getting along. She often beat me, and a couple of times she could have seriously hurt me. Whenever I got on my mother's nerves, she would tell me, I don't care who you go and tell that I punished you. If they want you, they could have you because I am tired of you. Or she'd say, I never had this problem with my sons. Why couldn't you be like them? I felt like my mother didn't want me, even though she had adopted me. I felt that she wanted a replica of her children, who didn't act out so much and didn't get in trouble in school standards I could never live up to. It didn't help that much that my extended family never really accepted me. Every Christmas, they acted funny towards me. I found out later that some of them never wanted my adoptive parents to adopt me in the first place. When things got really bad with my mom, I went to one of my aunts for help, and she threatened to call the police on me for running away. She didn't like me, and the truth is, she didn't like my mom either, and she just didn't want to be involved. I ran away for the last time when I was 14, even though my mother wanted me back. I felt she had put me through too much to return. I rejected the only family I had had for the last 10 years, a family I had come to feel didn't want me, but just put up with me. I'm 19 now, and I've been on my own for the last five years. I've lived with a friend, I've lived on the streets, and I've lived in a foster care home. I've grown a lot, but I haven't really come to terms with my feelings about being given up or about being adopted. I have friends and other people who support me now, so to a large extent the feelings of loneliness have disappeared, but my anger has not. Instead of blocking it out, I talk to my boyfriend about it and try to make sense of it all. Maybe one day I will forgive and forget, but right now I feel like the only true family I will ever have is the one that I will one day start. I do have some contact with my adoptive mother. Sometimes I talk to her when I call my sister, who still lives with them. My mother wrote me a letter apologizing for the past, and she has even asked if she could come to my college graduation. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure I can forgive her yet for all the things she said and did to me that really hurt. I don't think I will ever forgive my extended adoptive family. They weren't there for me and my mother when we were having troubles. They didn't stick by me. They made me feel like they never wanted me. To this day, I carry around with me this feeling of not belonging and this feeling of wanting to belong. When I was younger, I was able to block the memory of Brenda out of my mind. But now, it's not so easy. I look into the mirror and I want to know who I look like. If the children I intend to have one day ask, Mommy, what was she like, your real mother? I want to be able to answer that, or I'd like my kids to be able to ask her for themselves. It seems like the chance of finding her are as slim as the skin peeled off an apple, so I gave up on that. I realize I may never find her. I'll have to accept that. Still. I want to find her, and the thought of her comes into my mind often. I am angry at her. I am angry because she lied to me, and I am angry because she left me. But I still believe that even if I found out that Brenda was not alive or even in jail, it would bring a sense of closure. It would fill up that empty space in my heart. Do you guys think I should keep looking for her? Or is it too late?